Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. From Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm, we read David saying, You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Here is Heidi Taves to sing, Fill my cup, Lord. Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions and we search the scriptures in order to find the answers from God's holy, inerrant, and authoritative word. Question number one. Who are the five virgins without oil in the parable which we find at the beginning of Matthew chapter 25? You will remember that Jesus, as he is preparing his disciples for his departure, Matthew chapter 25, immediately proceeds when Jesus heads over and it, to the Garden of Gethsemane and he will be betrayed and denied, arrested, and on it goes. But Jesus here is in the final moments of preparing his disciples and he gives a parable of five virgins. This is at a wedding feast. Five who were foolish and five who were wise or prudent. For the foolish, they had their lamps and they were present, but they had no oil in order to augment the light of that occasion. But the wise or the prudent, they had all that they needed. And so who are those foolish ones? I give the answer. People who have been to church, they have an acquaintance with the things of God. They have been to church to, say, to uh, read the Bible, to sing the hymns, to hear the preaching, but they have never personally known repentance in their own heart. 
and the miracle which Jesus spoke to Nicodemus of, the miracle of new birth, of being truly born again. Another way of putting it is that these are people who have had just enough religion in their lives in order to inoculate themselves against the real thing. And so they are shut out. They are closed out. These are not people who are at a great distance. These are ones who have been invited. They are ones who could have entered in so easily. But there was no preparation. They took a very casual approach to the things of God and to the Bible. It was on a shelf, but they never took it down and read it. They never prayed. There was no inner stirring of their heart towards the things of God. Oh, let that be the warning that Christ intended it to be, that we might be watching and that we might be ready for when he comes again. Question number two. Why does Faith to Live By continue to broadcast prob uh, programs which include Pastor H.H. H. Barber when he has now passed on to glory? He has died. This question has come from more than one individual, and so I think it pertinent that we give an answer to it. I trust that you do not only read books and literature which is read, it, that, that has been written by living authors. I trust that you read and that you benefit from those who have passed away in centuries gone by, even millennia gone by. And so we have the Bible. All of the human authors who were stirred by the Holy Spirit, they were, they, they have gone on to glory as so many others which we could benefit from. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4, we read about Abel that though he is dead, he still speaks. And it is for this reason, and it is not because we want to offend anyone or that we want to uh, make you uneasy by hearing from a dead man, but Abel, that testimony is given of him that though he is dead, he still speaks. And we believe that Pastor H.H. H. Barber, though he has died, he has gone on to glory, his eternal reward, yet there is riches, there is treasure. Faith to Live By continues to produce new programming for airing, usually on Sundays, and the programs, which in various outlets on radio and television, are used Monday to Friday, those are repeats. And so we're not trying to trick or fool anyone. It is simply that we desire to share blessing with you, and we trust that that is clearly understood. Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us, and we will use it as quickly as we are able. Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C, 2H6 is the address you need to keep in mind. Tim Sturby now comes to sing Thanks to Calvary. Today I went back to the place where I used to go Today I saw that same old crowd I knew before And when they asked me what had happened I tried to tell them I don't come here anymore Thanks to Calvary I am not the man I used to be Thanks to Calvary Things are 
are different than before And as the tears ran down my face I tried to tell them Thanks to Calvary I don't come here anymore And then we went back to the place Where I used to live My little boy, he ran and hid behind the door like so many times before and I said son please don't be afraid you've got a new daddy now and thanks to Calvary I don't live here anymore thanks to the dad I used to be thanks to Calvary things are different than before and as the tears ran down my face I tried to tell him Thanks to Calvary I don't live here anymore Thanks to Calvary I don't live here anymore Faith to Live By has just released a new CD and book project entitled The Sermons in the Sermon. It's Luke's record of the earliest preaching of the first century. The messages which Peter, Stephen, Philip, and Paul preached and Luke took and recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. 21 of them I used on Faith to Live By in a series three years ago. I've taken these sermons now and I've included them in this book that they might be a personal blessing to you and that you might also use them perhaps in a Bible study setting. Also as a bonus to the book, we have included two audio CDs of readings from the book of Acts and these are there from the King James Version for your blessing wherever you move about. Ask for your copy of the sermons in the sermon when you write to Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C 2H6. You may also call us toll free at 1-833-367-3852 or our website faithtoliveby.ca also has a means of you contacting us. Thank you for being with us, and may these resources be a rich blessing to you in addition to the radio and television ministry of Faith to Live By. Rick Bowring now sings, No Name Has Meant So Much to Me. Jesus, 
that blessed name which sets the captive free. The only name through which I find salvation. No name on earth has meant so much to me. That name brings gladness to a soul in sorrow. It makes life shadows and its clouds depart. Bring strength in weakness for today, tomorrow. That name brings healing to an aching heart. My heart is thrilled whenever I think of Jesus. That blessed name which sets the captive free. The only name through which I find salvation No name on earth has meant so much to me That name still lives and will live on forever While kings and kingdoms will forgotten be through mist or rain will be beclouded never that name shall shine and shine eternally my heart is thrilled whenever I think of Jesus that blessed name which sets the captive free the only name through which I find salvation No name on earth has meant so much to me No name on earth has meant so much to The book of Revelation has been a favorite of Christians all through the past 2,000 years, but especially in the first century and through times of tremendous struggle and trial. The book of Revelation has lifted the hearts of people who have looked to the Lord for his power to be made manifest in their particular situation. You see, the book of Revelation is not simply a book of terrible monsters. It is the book which describes that our God is the one who rules in the affairs of men and that at the last day he against Satan's most determined onslaught that God shall have the preeminence that he shall be the one who is standing when the devil has been thrown to the lake of fire and to eternal torment. But the book of Revelation also speaks to us from one who on the island of Patmos, because of his faithful witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, he was on Death Island. I'm speaking of the Apostle John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, the one who provided for us, humanly speaking, the Gospel of John, who we rejoice in, and the three epistles of John. But then we find him on Patmos, and Jesus Christ, the one who had walked with him for three years alongside of Galilee, who had called him from the fishing boats of his father, he and his brother James, and who had transformed his life in the most radical way, the the young man, John, who was formerly known as one of the sons of thunder, probably in an indication of a unsettled temperament and one who is quick to fly off the handle. One who speaks to us of the goodness of God, 
who rejoices in all of the kindness that we have personally and collectively received from God's hand. But I want to especially take you into Revelation chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6. And I want you to see three things that are held out most pointedly. It describes what Christ has done for you and what Christ has done for me. I begin reading with verse 4 to lead into this. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, that area which now we understand as Western Turkey, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace. That was the greeting of the Greek world, grace, and the greeting of the Hebrew, the Jewish world, peace, shalom. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. You see, Jesus Christ was not simply born in Bethlehem and that that was the start of it. He was there on creation's morning and he was there in eternity past. He is the one who was. He is the one who now is. And he is the one, John, as he looks to the future. He is the one, the Lamb of God, who stands there at the throne of his heavenly Father. He is the one who shall ever be. John says, from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits of God, the perfect spirits of God, which are before his throne, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. It is impossible for God to lie. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness who has come among us that he might declare the Father to us and that we might be the hearers of a word that is beyond doubt. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. And John says unto him, that loved us, washed us, and made us. Those are the three points I hold out to you today. The greatness of the work of God in redeeming a people unto himself. First of all, there was the love of God that was lavished upon each and every one of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, have everlasting life. Unto him, John directs the reader's attention to the one who has loved us with a surpassing, with an overflowing, with a constant love. Unto him that has loved us. But that wasn't all that he did. He provided for our cleansing. He is the one who has also washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus is the one who is the only one able to come and to cleanse us from the defilement of this world. We have tried in various ways by our own efforts, by our own works. Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden, they took some leaves thinking that they could sew them together and that their embarrassment, their shame could be covered to no avail, God knew what the need was. And as a foreshadowing, he takes some animals, skins them, and he gives covering to Adam and Eve. But it was pointing ahead. It was pointing to what Jesus would do on Calvary's cross. The perfect sacrifice who would come to die. And he gave his blood that we might know cleansing from guilt, from shame, from the penalty of sin. Unto him that has loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. But that even isn't all. We would praise him for all eternity for his love. 
and we would praise him with loud voices for the cleansing that he has provided. But John says there's something more. And isn't it just like God that he, where others might say, oh, that's enough for them, they never deserved anything. They never deserved an ounce of love. They never deserved a drop of your blood. But the one who has loved us, the one who has washed us, he is the very one who has made us. What has he made us? He has made us kings and priests. It doesn't get any better than that. These New Testament saints in the first century, they would have zeroed in on that instantly to understand that God has made us royalty and he has made us of the highest occupation, kings, priests, unto God and his Father. And the response that John makes to this is to him, to him be glory and dominion both forever and ever. And he says with an exclamation mark, amen. Dear friend, have you known the love of God? Have you known the cleansing, the powerful detergent of God's own son's blood that you might be cleansed, that you might be washed of the defilement of your sins? Have you known the privileged position which he bids you to take up for he has made it possible for you? You did not deserve his love. You did not merit his cleansing, that blood. You most certainly did not deserve to be called a king or a priest unto our God. But this is what Jesus Christ has done for you. Would you come to him? And would you say, Lord, for your love, for your cleansing, for the appointment which you have given to me, I thank you and I praise you and my eyes are set totally upon you, and I thank you. Indeed, to you be all praise, honor, and glory. Amen. Pastor Barber today. Please watch for Faith to Live By again next Sunday at this same time on this same station. Until then, Faith to Live By prays that the peace of God will fill your heart and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Pastor Barber would love to hear from you. The mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. 